Uh, so you don't need to have anything out. Just um, here's what I want you to do, guys. You don't have to take any notes. I'm gonna give you an assignment to do after this. We're gonna have a discussion about some of the things that I have on these slides. Um, I want you to have your either you can grab a calculator or just have your cell phone calculator in front of you. Crunch a few numbers. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about today ties into what the assignment I posted to you on Monday. If you haven't done that yet, it's not the end of the world because you guys know what averages look like. You know how to find an average. Uh, you know how to find a ratio. You've already done that stuff. I'm going to show you guys some cool things. It's called Simpson's Paradox. We'll talk about what that means here in a second. Um, and we're going to use the batting averages. So this might actually be a little help. If you haven't done the homework, it'll kind of help you out right now. To find the batting average of somebody, uh, you divide the hits by at-bats. So you just divide hits divided by at-bats. I have two players on here. Derek Justice, or David Justice and Derek Jeter. Uh, Christian, what team do they, they play for? What team did they play for? They both played for the Yankees. Okay? Both played for the Yankees, both played for the Yankees at the same time. Two different scenarios, though. Derek Jeter in 1995 was a rookie. He was starting out. He didn't even start the year with them. He got called up um, mid-year. That's why his at-bats were kind of low compared to Justice. David Justice, on the other hand, at the end of his baseball career, um, he was winding down. Uh, he had just passed his prime. And he retired after the 1996 season. Look at Derek Jeter. Obviously had a really good season that season as he got into his second year in the majors. Okay. And we kind of know what happened after that. Here's what I want you guys to do. I'm going to spread this out. I need you, uh, uh, Faith, will you tell me Derek Jeter's batting average in 95? Calculate that with your calculator. All you got to do is divide hits by at-bats. So hits divided by at-bats. Claudia, Will you do David Justice in 1995? Draven, will you do Jeter in 96? And Adrian, will you do um, Justice in 96? Hits divided by at-bats. Hits divided by at-bats. You guys at home, I just want you to watch and follow along. Um, this this little lesson will take about 20 minutes or so. Do, are, are we doing like a percent? Uh, it is a percentage, okay. but don't multiply it by 100. I don't want the percentage number written as a percentage. I want it as a decimal because batting average is always written as a decimal to three decimal places. So uh, what did you get, Faith? Uh, 0. 0.25. 0. 0.25. And actually, the way they write it in baseball, they'll add that zero at the end uh, because it's three decimal places. Uh, Claudia, what did you get for um, David Justice? 0. 0.253. 0. 0.253. Do we agree that David Justice had a better batting average than Derek Cheater in 1995? Yes. Yeah. He had a higher one. Uh, by three one hundredths of a three one thousandth of a point, but still better. Um, in 1996, Javen, what did you get for Jeter? Yeah, 0. 0.314. 0. 0.314. And Adrian? 0. 0.321. Okay. And again, do we agree that David Justice had a better batting average? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's obvious. You can see it right there. Okay. So in 1995 and in 1996, uh, David Justice had a better batting average than Derek Jeter. Okay, watch this. Um, Christian, will you do Derek Jeter's combined uh, hits? All I did was add the hits and I added the at-bats. I combined them together. Alan, do the justice one. Okay. What's that? Christian, what did you get for Jeter? Three Point what? Three hundred nine, And I think that rounds up to 310 because uh, what's the number after nine? Five, yeah. So that rounds up to point three one zero. Alan, what'd you get? Point two seven zero. Point two seven zero. What the f just happened? Okay. How is it possible that David Justice had a better batting average in nineteen ninety five, had a better batting average in nineteen ninety six, but when we combine them together, Derek Jeter had a better batting average? Say that again. Win. In 95, he didn't have more at-bats. But in 96, he had a lot more at-bats, right? Justice also had a lot more at-bats. And um, Yeah, it has to do – you're right. I mean, it has to do with the, the sheer difference in the number of at-bats and number of hits in between each year. David Justice had a lot more than Jeter in 95, but Jeter had a lot more than Justice in 96. This caused – What's what we call, what we call as the Simpsons paradox, where if we look at data 
together, it might tell us something different than if we looked at data separately. I'm going to show you a short video real quick to kind of illustrate um, to illustrate that that um, I'm going to make sure that I shared this right with the audio. I hope you guys at home this comes out okay. Uh, but it's all talk, talks about the coronavirus. When we you hear on the news a lot of different numbers. Okay, we can distort numbers the way we want to distort them. Um, but when you hear stuff like uh, we have the hot, most cases in the world because we have do the most amount of testing. Well, we do do a lot of testing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the number of deaths is related to that. Um, this in this, I'm not, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but in this clip right here, we're going to see the difference between China and Italy, where China has a lot of cases, but Italy itself actually has way more deaths than China does, and it talks about why. Let's see. In this video, we're going to talk about Simpson's paradox. This is a fascinating statistical paradox that causes a lot of problems in the ways we think about and report on all sorts of statistics in society. For example the survivability of COVID-19. So let me illustrate this with an example. I'm gonna compare China oh, awesome. and Italy. Italy was one of the initial countries in the COVID-19 pandemic to have a huge spike in cases after it left China. And I'm gonna focus on something called the CFR or case fatality rate. Basically this says, if you have COVID-19, what are your chances of surviving this particular disease? Now, it turns out that when you look at all the cases, and I'm going to focus on a period between early March and late May, when you look at all the cases in China and all the cases in Italy, there's a clear pattern. You are more likely to survive in China than you are in Italy. And you can wonder why that might be the case, or you can question the reliability of that data. But nevertheless, let's take that as a fact for this video. You're more likely to survive in China than you are in Italy. However, it turns out that if you dig a little bit deeper, a very different type of relationship appears. In this chart, I am breaking down the CFR rate based on different age groups. So I'm looking at 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, and so on every 10 years. And if you look at any one of those age range, take say 60 year olds, it turns out that 60 year olds in Italy who have COVID-19 are more likely to survive than 60 year olds in China who have COVID-19. Same for 70 year olds, same for 80 year olds, same for 20 year olds in every different age bucket. You're more likely to survive if you get the disease in Italy than you are in China. And yet overall, when you put the total here, when you aggregate it all up, it's better off to be in China than it is in Italy. So how can that be? How can in every possible age bucket, it be better in Italy, yet overall it'd be better in China? So I actually encourage you to pause the video and see if you can figure out what a reason for that might be. All right, if you got that, wonderful, you're an excellent statistician, but if you're just here to enjoy the show, then the answer is about age demographics. This chart shows the breakdown in terms of age. It shows the percentage of the total patients who are in any different age range. And what we see here is that in Italy, there is a higher proportion of older patients, patients in their 80s and 70s, than there are younger patients, patients in say their 30s or 40s. And this matters a lot because one of the key features of COVID-19 is that it is much easier to survive if you are younger than if you are older. So the fact that Italy has this higher proportion of older patients who have gotten COVID-19 means their survivability rates are pulled down because of this phenomenon. So even though they're doing a relatively good job among any individual age group, that they have more of the higher risk age groups in their overall profile causes a problem. And that's the core idea of Simpson's Paradox. Simpson's Paradox is when the trend for aggregate data, when you put everything together, is different from the trend when you go and subdivide it into different categories and you look within each category. And that's exactly what's happened here. So... China was having a lot more younger people. China, first of all, has a bigger population than anywhere. You got over a billion people in China alone, right? So you've got a lot of people with that are young that got COVID, but they're not dying as much because young people are surviving COVID a lot better rates than older people are. The older people in Italy had a lot more people with older population got COVID 
but they're dying more. And it looks like that they're not handling it as well when in fact they just, for some reason, whatever reason, we can look that up later, um, that the older people in Italy are getting COVID at more than the younger ones. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different examples of how we can look at Simpson's paradox. A couple of different examples. In this video, we're going to talk about Simpson. Okay, so here's a map. Um, this is an election map from an election. I'm not going to tell you which one it is yet. And I want you guys to tell me, just by looking at the map, which candidate looks like they won. The red represents the counties that voted for the Republican and the majority. And the blue represents counties that voted for the Democrat majority. Which candidate do you think won the popular vote in this particular election um, and why? It looks like Republican, but you think Dem I'm trying to trick you or what? Yeah. Why? I'm not trying to trick you, but no, tell okay, me what your reasoning is. Where, like, you see most of the blue, those are, like the bigger counties. The bigger counties? Yeah. The blue is the bigger cities. So how many of you think the Republicans won this election by a popular vote? How many of you think Republicans won this election by, or the Democrats won this election by a popular vote? Anybody know what election this one is? Is this a 2016 presidential election? Okay. So, uh, as you guys know, Republicans won the Electoral College, which is a different story. We can You can talk about that in your government class. Uh, but this particular uh, map shows that uh, the popular vote by county, so the, the darker the color it is, the more it voted percentage, higher percentage for that particular uh, candidate. So dark red means a very, very high percentage of Republicans, and dark blue means very high percentage of Democrats. Uh, Democrat uh, Hillary won by almost three million votes. That is that is the uh, popular vote. But why does it show? Why does it look like it's more red though? Why does it look like that? Uh, because the smaller cities usually vote red. Like, so the smaller cities usually vote red. No, no, I mean smaller like counties. Smaller okay. Counties vote red. So they're the the rural counties. Yeah. Okay. So when we look at this, why does it look really lopsided? Well, you're right. You're on the right track. Where are the most populous cities? The most po 10 most populated cities in the U.S. are right here. Okay. What do you notice about all 10, almost all 10 of those cities? They're all in blue. With the exception of Phoenix, they're all in blue counties. Now, again, this is a government question where we're talking about why do large cities tend to, tend to skew Democrat, tend to skew to the left. That's a different story. That's not talk about in math class. But we do see that the fact that there are – 10 per, like literally 10% of the entire U.S. population is comes from just those 10 cities. And if you wanted to expand that to the top 30 cities in the country, uh, which I think 25 of them um, have Democratic mayors, um, you can see why it looks the map would look like this. When you go rural, you get a lot of um, conservative and Republican voting and ideals out um, in those areas. So. Again, the map can be misleading. If you wanted to make it look a little bit more like what it should look like, well, now we have a map like this where the concentration is shown of how blue or how red each of those areas voted. What do you think the white space represents in this map? Land. It's just land. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously people that live in, out in those things, but they're scarce. And when you're talking about um, you know, acres and acres and acres of desert or farmland or, or open places, okay? You know, you got Yosemite and Yellowstone all the way up here. It, it's literally where people don't live. So this is a more accurate representation of what uh, a voting map would look like. And this was for the election, that particular election. It's not everyone. Um, and it's too early to, to put up. I was going to put updated ones on here, but we have states and, and counties that haven't been called yet. So um, I didn't want to put it in, incomplete. Let's look at something else. So the Senate is a little another different race that could be looking at. We go back just two years to the 2018 uh, Senate midterm elections. Overall, in the entire United States, overall, there were 40 million votes cast for Democratic senators. but And there were only 31 million votes cast for Republican senators. What happened in 2018, though? Republicans gained three seats in the House. Okay, this is a fact. How is it possible that Republicans gained three seats when Democrats outvoted them by 9 million votes? How many, how many senators do each state have? Two. 
Does anybody else vote for a Texas senator besides Texans? No. So now we're looking at just the populations of each individual state and the way we determine these things. Look at the state of Texas with a population of about 20 plus million people, right? There's a lot of people in Texas. We're voting for just two senators, just two senators. You can live in Oldham County right here, and there's only 816 people in there, okay? Only 816 people voted in Oldham County. How many think voted in Harris County where Houston's at? 1.2 million, okay? 1.2 million people voted alone in Harris County. That's not how many people are there. There's like 4 million people in Harris County, okay? But 1.2 million people voted there. Let's now flip the script. Let's look at Wyoming. How many people do you think voted in Wyoming in general? Two. <laughs> 203,000 people in all, voted in all of Wyoming. This is why that looks that way, okay? So we can't just look at data together. We have to sometimes look at it separately or vice versa, okay? Or vice versa. Um, I have this little uh, tidbit of another study that was done where we talked uh, about they were comparing United Airlines saying that Continental had a higher percentage of flight delays than United Airlines. And they were wondering why, well, Continental, that's, nobody wants to ride with them because they have a higher percentage of um, flight delays. And why was that happening? Well, when they really looked at the places that Continental was flying, how many of you, how many of you never been on a plane? Never been on a plane? How many of you have been on a, on a flight and had to, get, had to get stuck because of weather? Had to stay on the, in the airport or, God forbid, on the tarmac in the plane because that's, our, that's the worst ever because if you're on the tarmac and you're still on the plane, you can't even get up to go to the bathroom. That's the worst. Uh, trust me. One time I had to go so bad and they wouldn't let me go. Um, and uh, they found that Continental flew to cities that have a higher ratio of bad weather. Okay. So they were flying to places like Chicago, snow and rain all the time. Seattle, rain all the time. Okay. These places up north that have bad weather, Boston, snow all the time. You know, then they had weather delays. They were flying to more of those places than United Airlines was flying. This is called a confounding variable. And the only reason I bring this example up because I wanted to show you guys what a confounding variable is. Let me give you one more example. Imagine that I split this class into two right down the middle. Okay. Next test. The next test I do, this side of the class gets to listen to their music, and this side of the class does not get to listen to their music. Sorry. Okay, you take the test, I get I grade them. This class does on this side of the class that got to listen to their music does on average 10 points better than this side of the class that didn't get to listen to the music. Does that mean that the music helped them get a better score? It does? No. That was a crappy experiment. What are some reasons why this side of the class could have done better than this side? They could have they could have paid more attention, right? They could have studied more. What? There's less people. That's a very good point. Okay, it needs to be an even amount of people, right? Um, they could have studied. You guys could have had a bad nights last night. Didn't get a very good sleep. Okay, those are all called confounding variables. Okay, so those are all things that we can, that we don't control, that we don't take care of, that we need to look in. That's why I wanted to bring that part up. Um, I'm going to skip this part, if that's okay with you guys. Another study, it was just a study that shows um, stuff, but I wanted to skip it. So let me get to the last part. So here's the last thing um, I'll talk about. Because this will lead you into your, your assignment. Your assignments, you're going to do a little case study. Okay. Um, this happened about 40 years ago, and it caused a pretty big problem. And you'll see in here, and I'll talk about it as soon as the video is done. This video is in like three minutes. So we're at, guys at home, we're almost done. Um, watch the video, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So talk about how um, Simpsons Paradox works in a, in a kind of another real scenario. Thank you.
Imagine a future cat-topia where both cats and people are applying to the physics and astronomy departments. In astronomy, two cats are accepted and two rejected, while one human is accepted and one is rejected. On the other hand, in physics, one cat gets in and two don't, while two humans get in and four don't. So overall at the university, three cats are accepted and four rejected for a 43% acceptance rate, while three humans are accepted and five rejected for a 38% acceptance rate. Is the university discriminating against humans in its application process? Possibly not. That's because if each department reviews its own applications, then the numbers show that the astronomy department lets in 50% of cats and 50% of humans, which seems fair, and the physics department lets in 33% of cats and 33% of humans, which again seems fair. The reason then for the apparent unfairness at the university level is the imbalance in how many cats and humans apply to each department. More of the cats applied to the astronomy department, which happened to let in a greater proportion of applicants, regardless of species, while more of the humans applied to physics, which let in a smaller proportion portion of applicants. This situation is another illustration of Simpson's statistical paradox, and something like it actually happened at Berkeley in the 1970s, which realized it was letting in 44% of men applying to the graduate school, but only 35% of women. Careful analysis was able to show that women tended to apply more to departments that had less funding and few- No! Thus, oh. within each department, which was the level at which applications were evaluated, there wasn't obvious evidence of gender discrimination among applicants. If anything, women were favored, and yet the unequal distribution of women and men across departments resulted in an unequal distribution of women and men at the university overall. The question then is what caused the unequal distribution of women and men to begin with? One can of course imagine a sinister institution that knows how Simpson's paradox works and wants to discriminate against a particular group. All they have to do is advertise smaller, more competitive departments more heavily to that group, and vice versa for groups they want to promote. More realistically, certain departments or fields may have reputations for being unwelcoming and unsupportive towards women, even if they let them in fairly. And it's also possible that other aspects of a university itself attract applicants who are more likely to follow gendered career stereotypes. But ultimately, as the Berkeley study concluded, the problem is a bigger societal one. The absence of a demonstrable bias in the admissions system does not give grounds for concluding that there must be no bias anywhere else in the educational process. Women are shunted towards fields of study that are generally more crowded, less productive of completed degrees, less well-funded, and that frequently offer poorer professional employment prospects. Those words were written in a statistics paper in 1975, and more recent statistics tell us that they still remain true today, which is unfortunate if you think women and men should have equal opportunities and or be paid equally for equal work. So the paradox isn't really in the statistics, since after careful analysis, the statistics tell us we're biased, and even hint at where those biases are or aren't coming into play. No, the paradox is that we've remained so reluctant to fight our biases, even when they're put in plain sight. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning site with courses on all sorts of creative, business, and technological skills, like proper knife skills, or how to make animated graphs for a video, or how to fly a drone, or how to design a logo for your knife-carrying drone-flying animated graph company and so on. You can get two months of Skillshare for free by going to Skullsh slash Minute Physics. Again, that's Skullsh slash Minute Physics. So, the, uh, I mean, basically what I was saying, so back in the 70s, University of California, Berkeley was sued by a group of women because when they looked at the admission rates between men and women, men were getting admitted at an overall higher rate than women. That looks bad, doesn't it? I mean, right off the bat, it already looks bad. It was pretty, it was almost 9% higher. And so they're like, what the hell? Why, why are men getting in more often than women? And this case went to, went to a state Supreme Court. I don't know if it went to the Supreme Court that far. But it got a lot of attention. And it made them realize that they needed to look deeper at why that was causing that to happen. And if you remember from the video, it said women were applying for departments that were harder to get into. Men were applying for departments that were easy to get into. Isn't that right, man? That's what, we, that's what we like to do, take the easy way out, right? That's what was happening. And so even though it, if you look at each individual department, that wasn't really the case. When we added it all together, it looked like there was a problem there. And that's not to say that there's still a problem in the workplace with the gender gap and pay and other, and other equality things. Um, but in this particular case, that wasn't – they weren't – nefariously intentionally trying to uh, admit men at a higher rate than women. 
Um, so a couple of things, and this will be in your assignment too. Uh, how do we avoid falling victim to this? Because this is, can be a big problem if you're looking at data um, or you could use it to your advantage, depending on what point you're trying to make. If I'm trying to make a point of something, I might want to use a paradox like this to make that point, especially if I have something like politics or if I'm a statistician trying to, to uh, pers if I work for a, um, trying to make a, hold on just a second. Whoop. Hey, hey. She's not here yet. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. So um, we do got to look at, we got to examine combined results cautiously. Sometimes we need to take that combined results and look at it separately. So that's one thing to, to do. Uh, make sure it's true when you break it all up. L look for confounding variables. Those are the things that we talked about. What else could be causing that to happen? Okay, those are the two big things. Um, next semester when we get into statistics and we start running experiments, we start looking at stuff like using randomization. Okay. Uh, Alan brought this up a second ago. When I broke this up, this class, he didn't realize it, but when I broke this class up into two sides, he said that there was less people over there than there are over here. Well, how do I fix that? Let's randomly put people into two groups, right? And then see how those people, how those groups do. Um, and then we use weights. Okay, you guys, we started that with this last assignment. Um, use weight, weight samples based on their sizes so that every, everybody is, has an equal opportunity. Okay, so... Um, the last thing you guys, this is it. So that was your little lesson for today. Uh, for the rest of the class period, you guys can work on your current assignment. It's in Schoology. If you guys are in class right now, I will hand you a paper copy if you want. And you guys at home can start working on that assignment in there. Um, it should not take you more than about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes at, at the most. I encourage you guys to work together on this one if you want to help each other out. Um, and I'll be walking around and helping you guys out. I'll stay online as well for you guys.